right, you know what I love about my profession? Um, I get to learn something every day. And what I did not know up until today was that there is a publication called Pup Sugar. Um, and recently in Pop Sugar, uh, an author by the name of Jessica Harrington did a piece on facelifts uh, with the subtitle being the suddenly not so taboo beauty procedure. Well, that's something that all plastic surgeons really have becoming more and more aware of. And what, what I mean is that we have seen more and more patients come in for consultations for facelifts. And what the interesting trend is in addition to the increased number is the declining age of the average patient requesting a facelift. Now, I've always seen patients in the past, you know, in a spectrum kind of from the 30s, which I often discourage patients thinking about a facelift in the 30s, all the way up obviously to the 70s and even 80s, so long as a patient is healthy. Um, but I've seen a trend where the bulk of our patients are starting to cluster at younger and younger ages, with uh, the fact being that recently I've seen a number of patients in their mid and even early 40s desiring facelifts. Um, and I think we can all understand what sort of societal changes and influences are leading to this desire. Obviously, uh, with the pandemic, but also with uh, the changes in technologies, in particular video conferencing and the way that we interact both socially, um, but also the, interact the way that we interact at work with using more and more video to make those experiences, those remote experiences real, people are becoming very conscientious um, and conscious of the way that they appear on video. And obviously, um, the face is the part of the body that is seen most um, in, the, in, the, in these videos. And so, again, we're seeing more and more patients interesting, interested in facelifts. And when you start to see a, a procedure become more popular, Obviously, the stigma and the taboo associated with a facelift um, or a procedure, and in this particular case, a facelift, is going to start to become less and less apparent in the general consciousness of, of a society. Um, so again, we've seen many more patients interested in facelifts, and we've seen a younger population group interested in that procedure. Now, when I speak of facelift, of course, I'm not just talking about a facelift. We're really talking about pan facial rejuvenation. What do we mean by pan? So that, that prefix pan basically kind of means comprehensive or all encompassing. So when we're thinking about, or when I use the short hurt, shorthand term facelift, I'm really talking about rejuvenation of the entirety of the face. And so that really goes from the hairline all the way down to the neck. And so we really, as we're evaluating a patient for, for rejuvenation of the face, obviously we always have to take the lead of what the patient is interested in. We have the happiest patients when it is the patient who really identifies the thing that bothers them most about the area that they're trying to change. But we as plastic surgeons focus on specific areas and in the face we kind of break it up into to thirds or at least halves. But the upper third really is the periorbital region and the forehead. And one of the, uh, or a couple of the more popular procedures in that area are brow lifts. And one of my uh, favorite ways to do it is an endoscopic brow lift. Um, but then also upper eyelid procedures, blepharoplasties, lower eyelid procedures, blepharoplasties. And many patients, um, especially in the older um, side of the facial rejuvenation spectrum, benefit from fat grafting to the temples. It gives the periorbital region, I mean the area around the eyes, a less bony, a less coarse, even a less masculine appearance, especially if we're talking about a woman. It's important to mention that not all patients seeking facelifts are women, but it does happen to be the, the, the case that they, they, they mostly are women. But anyway, thinking again about the periorbital region and the upper third of the face, um, we talked about a brow lift. I like to do an endoscopic brow lift in many, but not all patients. Um, uh, the reason I like an endoscopic brow lift is that we don't have to make incisions that are quite as large, there's less numbness. Um, it's, a, in my opinion, a very elegant procedure. I think in the past, um, brow lifts have gotten a little bit of a, a negative, or at least rather endoscopic brow lifts have got a little bit of a, a negative um, stigma or uh, around them. And the reason was is that they weren't quite as um, predictable and they weren't quite as um, effective as uh, people had wanted, both the practitioner and the patients. And the reason for that, I think, uh, at least in my opinion and experience, was the technique. Um, and so just sort of cut into the chase, the way that I like to do the procedure is with five small incisions 
um, in areas that really allows to have access to the, uh, to the upper third of the face, really all the way down to the cheekbones. And when that is the case, when you use all of those access sites and you really free the tissues up, you're able to lift all of the upper face, uh, the temple, even some of the upper cheek, the eyebrows, um, up into a, a more appropriate youthful location. Um, and also without doing it uh, in a way that creates a surprised look. And of course, a surprised look is a very relative thing. Um, and I always take the patient's lead um, when I'm thinking about how much of a lift I perform. And we think about that before and we establish what the patient wants. Um, upper eyelid procedures, blepharoplasties, um, those are actually one of the more common operations we do. Nowadays, what we're doing is mostly removing skin, but every once in a while, we're removing a little bit of fat. The upper eyelid blepharoplasty that was done in the past where a lot of fat was removed really isn't done anymore. Um, and the reason for that is that can create a skeletonized um, appearance uh, where you just see way too much upper eyelid um, uh, and you don't have a more healthy, youthful, plump appearance to the space between the eyebrows and the eyelid. So um, that's a blepharoplasty, small incision, generally very well tolerated, um, uh, uh, well hidden. Um, and then there's a lower eyelid blepharoplasty. Now, the lower eyelid blepharoplasty um, is one in which there's a, a greater variation in technique. The upper eyelid blepharoplasty, you know, among surgeons um, and for the majority of patients, there are some very consistent themes, very consistent incisions. Lower eyelid blepharoplasty is quite different. Um, there's more of an um, open approach where incisions are made uh, just along uh, the, uh, just beneath the eyelid uh, or the, the hairline, the, the um, eyelashes. Um, and with that, you can get uh, greater access to the eyelid, the eyelid fat, and even the upper cheek. Um, uh, that's a wonderful operation, but the recovery is a little bit longer um, and uh, it requires uh, more time off of work. Um, a step back from that, is making incisions within the eyelids called a transconjunctival approach, um, where really that type of procedure is meant really just to um, liberate and free and remove a small amount of fat, really to get rid of tear troughs and to get rid of bags, speaking of bags, um, to get rid of bags in the lower eyelid. Um, so it's a very effective way of addressing some of the contour irregularities. It doesn't address excess of skin in the way that the more open subciliary approach to uh, lower eyelid blepharoplasty can achieve. Now, um, there is an alternative to both of those, um, and that is what I like to call, um, and it really wasn't my terminology, but a skin pinch lower lid blepharoplasty. What that does is removes a small amount of skin right in the middle of the eyelid by kind of pinching the excess skin and just trimming it and then placing some a few small sutures. Now you would think, wow, you're putting a scar right in the middle of the lower eyelid. Isn't that going to be seen? And the answer to that is, well, sort of. Um, it is a scar. Scars are always there. Scars are always permanent. But it's a very privileged spot for a scar. W one reason is, is that it's some of the thinnest skin on uh, our face and, and thus our body. Um, and the thinner the skin, the more difficult it is to see scars because the scars are less, uh, less large, they're less robust, um, there's less collagen in them, so they're very difficult to see. Another reason they're difficult to see um, is that, that everybody really has fine lines in the, the skin of the lower eyelid anyway. Um, and so it's really kind of disguised perhaps as, as a line there. But again, it's a very well tolerated um, incision. And, and it's a nice complement to a transconjunctival blepharoplasty because again, a transconjunctival blepharoplasty can leave the excess skin behind, but the skin pinch can address that as well. So it's a nice complement to that or it can be done in isolation. Back to facelifts. You know, taking uh, one of the themes from the lower lid blepharoplasty, where there's a couple of different ways to do it, the same is true for a facelift. W let's define what we mean when a facelift. Well, a facelift is a surgical procedure to uh, remove um, some of the excess skin in the lower face, uh, to elevate the soft tissues, the underlying fat, and even the muscles and the skin, um, to reverse what gravity has done to the, the center part of the face. So a facelift really takes off where the brow lift stopped um, and goes down just about to the jaw. Now, if you've seen anything that I've talked about before, if you've heard anything that I've talked about before when I'm talking about facelifts, they almost always have to be paired with a neck lift because the face, at least the lower two thirds of the face, 
and the neck are essentially one structure. It's not as if one structure ends at the jawline and the other one starts. It's really one structure. So when we're talking about a facelift, we're almost always talking about a neck lift and vice versa. Every procedure might have, uh, when I say every procedure, I mean for any particular patient, of course, all these procedures are customized to the patient's anatomy and desires. Um, but when we're doing a facelift, it's always gonna involve some degree of a neck lift and vice versa. But depending on the patient and their needs and their desires, um, the emphasis may be a little bit more on the neck or the emphasis may be a little bit more on the face. Um, but really all patients undergoing one or the other benefit for some treatment to the lower face or the upper fa face, vice versa. Um, a facelift might involve a full facelift uh, where the incisions um, go along the hairline of the temples, then hug the contours of the ears and then back into the hairline. Or it might be more of a mid-face lift um, where the incisions are in the temples uh, and go down across the cheekbones and then into the deeper tissues of uh, the central face so that the lift uh, occurs at a deeper level. Um, that's good when a patient needs a, a lift in the mid face and doesn't really have a lot of excess skin in the central face. Um, a neck lift uh, may be achieved with um, you know incisions again that go behind the ears. Um, another way to get a little bit of a lift and it's uh, this is kind of stretching the terminology for neck lift um, but is to do some liposuction in the lower face and some energy-based, uh, surgical energy-based uh, therapy as well, such as a case that we did um, last Friday where we did some J-plasma. So we did some liposuction and then we did um, some uh, thermal shrinkage of the lower facial tissues in combination for with a mid-face lift. That was a perfect procedure for a woman in her very young 40s who really had no excess skin um, but had a little bit of laxity of the skin um, and uh, a little bit of excess fat, which was really um, uh, very specific to her anatomy. So that's a good example of an alternate to a traditional facelift, but I would still consider it a facelift and a, with a neck procedure um, because really we're trying to achieve some of the same things we do in older patients um, uh, who are undergoing a full face and neck lift. So there we go. That was a whirlwind tour. Any questions?